the Columbia Network takes pride in presenting Orson Welles in the first production of a unique new summer series by the Mercury Theater on the Air. In a single year, the first in the life of the Mercury Theater, Orson Welles has come to be the most famous name of our time in American drama. Says Collier's Magazine, 23-year-old Orson Welles threw a bombshell into Broadway. Robert Benchley writes in The New Yorker, The production of the Mercury is, I should say, just about perfect. Time Magazine declares, The brightest moon that has risen over Broadway in years. Welles should feel at home in the sky. For the sky is the only limit which his ambitions recognize. And finally, the United Press remark... Meteoric rise of Orson Welles' Mercury Theater continues unabated. With four hit shows in its first year, the Mercury might well close its door on a season unparalleled in Broadway history. But Mr. Welles has long been working on a project for a greater audience. The Broadways of the entire United States. The Columbia Network is proud to give Orson Welles the opportunity to bring to the air those same qualities of vitality and imagination that have made him the most talked of theatrical director in America today. And it is this project which Columbia brings you this summer. The first time in its history that radio has ever extended such an invitation to an entire theatrical institution. But here is Orson Welles himself to tell you about it. The director of the Mercury Theater, the star and producer of these programs, Orson Welles. Good evening. We're starting off tonight with the best story of its kind ever written. You will find it in every representative library of classic English narratives. It is Bram Stoker's Dracula. The next time I speak to you, I am Dr. Arthur Seward. George Galuris plays Jonathan Harker. And Martin Gable plays Dr. Van Helsing. It is Dr. Seward who tells the story. And so for the moment... Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you in Transylvania. The Mercury Theater on the Air presents Orson Welles as Count Dracula in his own version of Bram Stoker's great novel, Dracula. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Arthur Seward. I'm here tonight to bear witness to the truth of certain events which you may find it hard to believe, but I ask you to believe them. I have here certain documents, telegrams, clippings from the press of the day, memoranda, and letters in various hands. All needless matters have been eliminated, so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of contemporary belief may stand forth as simple fact. I present you first with excerpts from the private journal of Jonathan Harker. I, Jonathan Harker, lawyer's clerk, article to Peter Hawkins, Esquire of Exeter, England, am writing this journal in the hope that if misfortune overtakes me, it may one day come to the eyes of those who love me. I set out from London on the last day of April to visit one of our clients in Eastern Europe. On May the 3rd, I arrived in Budapest and came after nightfall to Klausenburg on the borders of Transylvania. At Bistritz, there was a letter of welcome for me from our client, informing me that his carriage would await me at the Borgo Pass. It was signed, Dracula. Young hair is not a 
unexpected after all. You are early tonight, my friend. A calèche with four horses are drawn up beside us. Let me help you, sir. The coachman smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. We began to move. I looked back. The coach and its load of passengers had vanished from sight. We swept into the darkness of the past. I struck a match. It was within a few minutes of midnight. And then a dog began to howl somewhere far down the road. The wind was rising, moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall. The baying of wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though, as though they were closing round us by every side. We kept on ascending, always ascending. The howling of wolves was growing less. Presently, it ceased altogether. And just then, the moon broke through the black clouds. I saw around us a ring of wolves running alongside the carriage. In silence, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long sinuated limbs and shaggy hair. Welcome to my house. I must have fallen asleep. The carriage had pulled up in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle. The coachman was nowhere to be seen. Welcome to my house. Come freely. Go safely. And leave something of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. The face was strong. Very strong. Aquiline. The mouth, so far as I could see under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with peculiarly sharp white teeth. Hmm. You hear me, Mr. Harker? The wolves? The children of the night, as you say, Mr. Harker. The wolves. Listen. Hmm. Come now. There are many things you must tell me tomorrow. Of England and of the estate there you have purchased for me. Ah, uh, yes. The estate is called Carfax, I believe. Yes, that is so. But now I will detain you no longer. You will find your room in readiness. And I advise you not to leave it. During the night. This castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. I explored. There are doors, doors, doors everywhere and all of them locked. The door to the great hall, the door to the courtyard, every door in the castle is closed, bolted against me. The castle of Dracula is a prison. And I am a prisoner. The next night I couldn't sleep. So after a few hours I got up and lighting my candle, I placed my shaving mirror on the dressing table and was just beginning to shave. You seem restless, Mr. Harker. I hadn't seen him. Although the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. I turned to the glass again. I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. It was blank. I started and cut myself on the side of the throat. The blood was trickling down my neck. Hound, my mirror! The blood! The blood! Wipe the blood from your face, Mr. Harker. And take care how you cut yourself. Is more dangerous than you think in this country. When I awoke, I found most of my things were gone. My passport, my notes, my letter of credit. I could find no trace of them anywhere. And my door is locked from the outside. June 20th. There is work of some kind going on in the castle. Now and then, I hear the faraway muffled sound of matter and spade. And last night, the second of the predated letters which Dracula made me write, the second of that series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth, went forth. Count Dracula. Yes, my young friend. Well, what of me? 
When am I free? When can I leave this place? Free? Mr. Harker, you're always free. You want to leave? Would you like to leave tonight? Yes, yes, in God's name. My dear young friend, not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Come. Follow me. Hmm. The door seems to be bolted. How strange. The door is locked. Well, in God's name, open it. As you will, Mr. Harker. You English have a proverb which is very close to my heart. Welcome the coming speed, the parting guest. Good night, Mr. Harker. Shut the door! Shut the door! I tell you, shut the door! Shut! The door is shut, Mr. Harker. I take it. You will remain. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. Oh, God preserve my sanity. I have never seen Count Dracula by day. At sunrise, at the first cock crow, he is gone. I... I do not understand these things. I only know that the wolves obey him, and that he is a man with hair on the palm of his hands, with sharp teeth, and no blood in his face. He casts no shadow. He cannot be seen in a glass. And he moves like a bat across the sheer face of the castle walls. He eats no food and is mortally afraid of the crucifix. As I write this, I hear in the courtyard the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. And there is in the passageway below a sound of heavy boxes being set down. Boxes shaped like coffins. And I know what they hold. Boxes are filled with holy earth from the chapel beneath the castle. It is the last box being nailed down. And now I hear the heavy feet tramping again. The door shut. The chains rattle. In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips. have gone. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Seward. Mr. Harker's journal terminates at this point. I now present in evidence a clipping dated August 8th of that year from the Yorkshire Telegraph from our correspondent in Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record was experienced here today. The weather has been somewhat sultry, but Saturday evening was fine, the band was playing, the piers were crowded with holidaymakers, the wind fell away entirely during the evening, and there was a dead calm. There were but few lights at sea. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner under full canvas, which was seemingly going westward. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. And there, with all sails set, was the foreign schooner rushing with terrific speed toward the shore. A searchlight was turned on her. And there, lashed to the helm, was a corpse with drooping head which swayed horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. A moment later, she crashed. And then a strange thing was seen. At the very instant she touched, a huge dog sprang up on deck from below and running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand and making straight up the east cliff toward the graveyard, vanished into the night. The coast guard going aboard at dawn found the dead man fastened to a spoke of the wheel. Tightly clutched in one hand was a crucifix. The man must have been dead for quite two days. In the pocket of the dead man's coat was found a bottle, carefully corked, containing a roll of paper. This proved to be an addendum to the ship's log. There was found on board only a small amount of cargo and that of a most unusual nature. Apparently the ship carried nothing but earth. Common earth. Packed away in wooden boxes. Shaped much like coffins. Go 
of the Demeter. July 6th. Finished taking in cargo, a queer cargo, boxes of earth. At noon, set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, four hands, two mates, cook, and myself, captain. July 11th. Entered Bosporus. At dark, passed through Dardanelles. Mate reported in morning that one of crew, Valjoden, was missing. Took Larbert watch eight bells last night. He was relieved by Chilich. Never came to his There's something aboard oh. this ship. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Don't laugh, Captain. In the rain last night. Oh. A tall, thin man go up companion way and along the deck forward and disappeared. When I go to the bow, no one. And the hatchways all closed. July 22nd. Rough weather last three days. All hands busy with sails. No time be frightened. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well, July 24th. Last night, another hand was lost. Disappeared. My Chilean, leave all watch midnight. Then we never see him again. What's double watch now? If I don't take watch alone no more. Double watch. Double watch. July 29th. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning comes... Hey! Hey, Milo! Where is he? Where is he? He's where is he, Milo? Where is he gone? Oh, where is he gone? Like the others. Like all the others. The mate and I have agreed to go armed henceforth, July 30th. Last night, we are nearing England. Weather fine. All sails set. Captain! Captain! The man in the watch in the stairs is missing! Both missing! Now, only self and mate and one hand left to work ship. August 3rd. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at wheel. And when I got to it, found no one there. It's here. I know it now. I saw it. Like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bars looking out. I gave it the knife and my knife went through it. What? Empty as air. What is it? What are you talking about? It's here. And I'll find it. It's in the hole in one of those boxes of earth. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. And see. He is mad. Stark raving mad. It's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are invoiced as common earth. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. August 4th. I am all alone on my ship. And still the fog. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed... And in the dimness of the night, I saw it. I saw him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a sailor in the blue water. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail. And along with them I shall tie that which it dare not touch. My crucifix. I am growing weaker. And the night is coming on. God and the Blessed Virgin help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Seaward, Perfit, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. Lucy was tenra in alarming condition. Cannot diagnose. Come at once. Seward. Telegram, Van Helsing, Amsterdam, to Seward, Perfit. 
And on my way to you, please arrange the examination immediately my arrival from Helsing. Ladies and gentlemen, I must now explain that six months before the events recorded here, I had become engaged to a young lady, Lucy Westenra. We were to have been married in the spring. My old teacher, Professor Van Helsing, arrived at four the next afternoon. I took him at once to Lucy's house. She lay in a bed asleep. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. The red seemed to have grown even from her lips and gums. And the bones of her face stood out. Young Miss is bad. Very bad. She must have blood or she will die. Yet she is not anemic. The qualitative analysis of her blood gives quite normal condition. It is strange. I do not like to think how strange. Look! My God, her throat, look! The black velvet band that she always wore had dragged up a little and showed a red mark on her throat. Just over the external jugular vein were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking. The edges were white and worn looking. Well? Well, what is it, Professor? What's wrong with her? Speak frankly, you can tell me the worst. I wish I could, Stuart. I wish I could. But I do not dare. But won't you tell me any, anything? I will tell you this. Your young lady is in a danger greater than death. You must believe me. If you leave her for one moment and harm befalls, you will not sleep easy thereafter. September 8th. I sat up all night with Lucy. Arthur, I'm afraid. My dear, you can sleep tonight. I'm here watching you. Nothing can happen. And I promise if any sign of bad dreams, if I see anything, I'll wake you at once. You will? Will you really? Then I'll sleep. I sat all night by her bedside. She did not wake once during the night, although her brows or a bat or something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. September 11th. Still quoting from my private journals. It's at this time that I received a message from Perfleet. Read 10.20 p.m. St. John's Hospital. Serious complications. Case 891. Your immediate presence, London. Imperative. I had no choice. Sometime later, a paper was found among Lucy Westenra's belongings. I write this and leave it to be seen so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the window was closed, as Dr. Van Helsing had directed. About two in the morning, I awakened. I went to the door, called out, Arthur! Arthur! There was no answer. Something's broken the window. I'm in the room, alone. I dare not go out. The house seems empty. The air is full of specks, floating, circling in the draft from the window. The light burns blue, dim. What am I to do? Something very sweet and very bitter all around me. And I seem sinking into deep water. You shall be flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. Ah. September 12th. Late. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. We found her sprawled on the floor. There was a draft in the room from the broken window. Her throat was bare, showing the two wounds. Looking horribly white and mangled. We are too late, my friend. We have failed. God's will be done. She's dying. Yes. She's dying. Stay beside her. It will make much difference, mark me. Whether she dies conscious... Or in her sleep. It was late in the afternoon. Before 
before she opened her eyes. Arthur. Oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. I took her hands and knelt beside her. Her breath came and went like a tired, peaceful child's. And then the light from the setting sun fell on her face. And then, insensibly, a strange change came over her. Her eyes grew suddenly dull and hard. Her breathing was heavy. The mouth opened and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look large and sharp. Arthur, oh, my love. I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Bend down and kiss me. Not for your life. Not for your living soul and hers. <laughs> Lucy. She's dead. Poor girl. There's peace for her at last. The end. Not so. It is only the beginning. Wait and see. The Westminster Gazette, September 25th. A Hempstead mystery. The Kensington horror, the stabbing woman, and the woman in black are vividly recalled to mind by a series of events that have taken place recently in the neighborhood of Hempstead. Several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or failing to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children have given us their excuse that they have been with a beautiful lady who offered them chocolates. In each case, the child was found to be slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seems such as might be made by a rat or a small dog. The Hempstead Her, another child injured by the beautiful lady. We have just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning. It has the same tiny wound in the throat. Well, Stuart, what do you think of that? You mean to tell me, my friend, that you still have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Nervous prostration, following great loss and waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? You are a clever man, my friend, and a good doctor. But you do not believe that there are things that you cannot understand... You are wrong, Stuart. Are you aware of all the mysteries of life and death? Can you tell me why in the pampas there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry those veins? Hmm? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on trees all day and then when the sailors sleep on deck because it is hot, flip down on them? And then in the morning, I found dead men as white as Miss Lucy was. I understand none of these things. Up to tonight, Stuart. If you dare to come with me, perhaps then you will understand. September 29th. Before dawn. And it is done. And I would sooner die a thousand deaths than live again through what I did this night. We will spend the night you and I here in this churchyard where Miss Lucy is buried. We enter the tomb, then we open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced. Take care, Van Helsing. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her, but if she's not dead. With some difficulty, we found the West End tomb. I took up my place behind a yew tree on one side of the tomb, Van Helsing on the other. I was chilled and frightened. Suddenly, I saw something moving between two yew trees, a dim white figure which held something at its breast. The figure stopped. I could not see the face, for it was bent down over what I saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire and dreams. Then the thing saw us. She drew back with an angry snarl. 
the lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square. If ever a face meant death, I saw it at that moment. Then suddenly she turned and vanished in the direction of the tomb. The child is not harmed. We leave him in a safe place where the police find him. There's more to do. Come. Now we were in the tomb. There in the coffin. The thing lay. Like a nightmare of Lucy, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained mouth. Then Helsing never looked up. From his bag, he took out a book, his operating knives, a heavy hammer, and a round wooden stake, some two or three inches thick, sharpened to a fine point, and hardened over a fire. Stuart! The life of this unhappy woman is just begun. Then she become what you call undead. There comes with the change, the curse of immortality. She cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims. Because all that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on others. So the circle goes on, ever widening as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. But if this lady, this undead, be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall be again free. Tell me, what am I to do? Take this stake in your left hand. The hammer in your right. Yes. Place the point over the heart. Yes. Then, when I begin the prayer for the dead, in God's name, strike. Are you ready? Now. Domine Jesu Christe, Fili de Vivi, qui manus tuas ex voluntate patri. July 11th, a man was found on the border of Transylvania. He talked wildly of wolves and boxes of earth and blood and gave his name as Jonathan Harker. In the hospital at Clausenburg, he improved sufficiently to make possible his removal to England. I'm still quoting from my own personal papers. But then his condition remained so serious that he was committed for observation to a private ward in my hospital at Perthit. Here he did so well that in three weeks he was completely recovered. It was during this time that his wife, Minna Harker, brought to the attention of Dr. Van Helsing and myself the journal that her husband had kept while a prisoner in the castle of a certain Count Dracula in Transylvania. I have before me the record of a meeting that took place in my study in Perthit, transcribed by Minna Harker. October 1st. Meeting again soon after 8. Jonathan next to me. Dr. Seward opposite to Van Helsing at the head of the table. My friends, there are such things as vampires. Had I known at first what now I know, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who love her. The vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong that he can direct all the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder... He can command all the meaner things, the moth and bat, the owl and the fox and the wolf. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his place? And having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, it is a terrible task that we undertake. To fail here is not mere life or death. If we fail, we become as him. Foul things of the night, as him. What do you say? I answer for myself. Come me in. I'm with you. The professor laid a small golden crucifix on the table. We took hands and our solemn pact was made. My friends, we too are not without strength. The vampire flourishes on the blood of the living. Without this, he cannot live. He throws no shadow. He makes no reflection in a mirror. He can transform himself to a wolf, to a bat. He can come on moonlight rays as elemental dust he can see in the dark. He can do all these things. Yet he is not free. His power ceases at the coming of the day. Then, until night... He must remain in the shape in which he finds himself. And except in his coffin home, in those earth boxes, he cannot rest. 
when we can confine him in his coffin, then, my friends, if we obey what we know, we will destroy him. At that moment, something flapped wildly against the window, then. Did you hit it? I don't know. We looked out of the window. Against the black sky, we could see nothing. Data in our position. From the Count's castle in Transylvania to Whitby came 50 boxes of earth. All of these, to our certain knowledge, were delivered at Carfax. Recently, 12 of these boxes have been removed. First step, ascertain whether all the rest remain in the deserted house next door or whether any more have been removed. We must trace each of these boxes and sterilize the earth with holy water so that he can no longer seek safety in it. And we must hurry. The events of the next few days are described in Jonathan Harker's journal. October 2nd, 5 a.m. Just returned from the empty house. Left Mina here at home. Well, we've done our work at Carfax. The place was filthy. The air stagnant and foul and alive with rats. We counted the boxes. Only 38 of them. And over each one, the professor went through his same mysterious work. It was dawn when we got back. I found Mina asleep. She looks... Paler than usual. October 2nd. Soon after they left, I fell asleep. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dog. And then, there was silence. I got up and looked out of the window. There was a thin streak of white mist moving across the grass along the wall of the house. It dawned on me that the air in the room was heavy and dank and cold. The gaslight came only like a tiny red spark through the fog. I could see through my eyelids. The mist grew thicker and thicker. Then, as I looked, the spark divided and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes. You shall be flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood. October 2nd, 8 p.m. We're on the track. Twelve boxes were delivered last week to an empty house at 347 Piccadilly. My dear friends, until the sun sets tonight, Dracula must retain whatever form he now has. We have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. Then he will have no place where he can move and hide. But we have only until sunset. The house in Piccadilly was empty. Like the one at Perth, the same sickening smell was in the air. On the table, we found a clothes brush, a brush, and a comb, and a basin. The latter containing dirty water, which was reddened as if with blood. The boxes are back here. Eight, nine, ten. Eleven. Oh, only eleven. There's a twelfth box somewhere. Gentlemen, it is after six. The sun is setting. We have no time to lose. He will return at any moment. Open the boxes. Quiet. Listen. Be ready. It is he. The window. You waste your bullets, gentlemen. Thank you, for me. You with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's. You think you've left me without a place to rest. But I have more. And time is on my side. The one you love is mine already. I have known her. Already my mark is on her throat. Flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. She is with me always. Over land or sea. October 4th morning. Another meeting in the study of Perkins. We must 
find that last remaining box, gentlemen. We must find it. As long as that earth exists impure, as long as there remains one place of refuge for Dracula, there is no safety and no peace for any soul in England. And for the undead, never peace so long as he lives. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood. Mina! How do you know that? Oh, well, not quiet. quiet. With me. With me always. Over land and sea. Mina, darling, how did you know that Dracula said those... I don't know. The words just came. Strange. There are times when somehow I feel that I'm with him. At sunset? Yes. Just at sunset. And again at sunrise. Dr. Van Helsing, if I could... If at that time you... Have you the courage? Courage for what? What do you mean? Dr. Van Helsing here will question me. I will question her, yes. In a state of hypnosis. The one you love is already mine, he said. She is with me always, over land or sea. Ah, Count Dracula. Perhaps she will betray you if she is really with you, this one we love. Who knows? If she is really with you over land or sea. Blood of my blood. Mina. Yes? Answer me, Mina. Are you with him? Yes, I am with him. Where are you? I do not know. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. I can hear it on the outside. Then you are on a ship? Yes. What else do you hear? There is the creaking of an anchor chain. What are you doing? Still. Oh, so still. It is like death. Yeah. Here's a report from Mats and Peabody. Shipbrokers. Dated October 5th, according to Lloyd's List, the only sailing ship that left for the Black Sea yesterday was the Tsarina Katrina, bound for Varna. Some hours before she sailed, a man came alongside, all in black, driving a cart with a great box in it. This he lifted down single-handed and carried below. No one remembers having seen him after that as... Heavy mist came up over Doolittle Dock until sailing time. The rest of London Harbor remained completely clear. Our plans are made. The average sailing time from London to the Black Sea is three weeks. We can travel overland to the same place in three days. We shall be there waiting for him when he arrives. October 15th, arrive barn about five o'clock. Mina seems stronger. Every morning before sunrise and just before sunset, she speaks to Van Helsing in a trance. Are you with him, Mina? Tell me, are you with him? I am with him. What can you see? Nothing. All is dark. What can you hear? I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds and the bow throws back the foam. So, the Tsarina Katrina... Is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. The Count cannot cross warning water. So he cannot leave the ship without being observed. What do you hear, Mina? Happy waves. Rushing water. Darkness. Darkness and wind. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams from Lloyd's. Not yet reported. 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 Rushing water and creaking mass. Darkness. Darkness and wind. October 24, Telegram. Lloyd, London to Harker. Sarina Katrina reported this morning. From Dardanelle. Lloyd's London to Harker, October 28. Sarina Katrina in heavy fog reported entering Galatz Harbor at 1 o'clock today. Galatz! Galatz is 38 hours from here. And the first train for Galatz leaves at 6.30 tomorrow morning. My friends, we have lost... Evening. We are due between two and three in the morning.
three hours late. Captain Serena Katrina. A man come aboard with an order an hour before sunup to receive a box for a party by the name of Dracula. Not his papers, a rate. Uh, Emmanuel Hillsheim, his name was. Mr. Hillsheim? Yes. You went over the box yesterday. I get a Kyloff by order. Kyloff. Mr. Kyloff? Hey, look. This morning they find him dead inside the churchyard of St. Peter. They find him dead. With his throat torn open. October 30th evening. There are two ways in which Dracula can get back to his own place. By land or by water. We've examined the map and find the most likely river is the Serra. You and I see what will charter a steam launch and follow him up the river. Van Helsing and Mina will take the train to Veresti and from there they will from go... there we shall go in the track where Harker went from district over to Porgo. If you have not caught him before, we shall be awaiting Dracula there. Speed up the river at night. There's plenty of water and the banks are wide apart. November 1st, evening. No news all day. We hear that a big boat went up the river before us, going at more than usual speed. November 4th. All day driving. The country gets wilder as we go. By morning we shall reach the Borgo Park. November the 4th, evening. We've left the launch. We've got horses and we follow on the track along the river. We are armed. Look! Quick! There they are now! Heading west! With the dawn, we could see the Slovaks some miles before us, dashing along the river with their wagons. On it is the great box. Beyond the white waste of snow was the river like a black ribbon curling. Between us and the river, not a far off, came a group of men, mounted Slovaks hurrying along. In the midst of them was a wagon which swept from side to side. On the wagon was a great box. Look! We see two horses following fast, coming up from the south. Now the horsemen are not more than a mile behind. Now the wagon is quite close to us. We can see the great box. Now has happened a strange thing. The wagon smashed into a great rock dead in the snow, lost its front wheels, and turned over on its side, jammed against the stone. The horses tore loose from their traces and bolted, and the Slovaks scatter and vanish after them. Then silence. Silence like comes uh, after ringing a bell. Look. His face. It is Dracula. Sprawled out stiff and twisted in the smear of his own holy earth. The box, in falling, has emptied the dirt onto the snow. His face is old looking. The skin is like paper. Dr. Seward, there's no time. Look at the sun. Sunset. In one minute there is darkness and he is forever lost to us. Have you the stake of wood and the hammer? Yes. Yeah. Now, Seward, pray for us. Kneel down and pray. Harker, the stake of wood over his heart. Mm-hmm. Be not afraid, Harker. Do not look into his eyes. The hammer. Now, Harker, strike. Strike. Flesh. Flesh of my flesh. Guilt of my guilt. Death of my death. Speak and be manifest in the instant. 
of your master's peril. Elements of darkness. Rain. Evil winds. Mist. And mold. And tempest. Right! The other couldn't. But somehow I can hear him. Speaking. Behind his eyes. Claw. Wing. Tooth. Scale. Tissue of flesh. Death of my death. Dead and undead. The hand of the living is over your master. Console him, my children. This instant is no longer than the space between two heartbeats. But the night is not here. And I am lonely. Come to your master, my children. Beguile him now in the instant of his peril. Beguile him with the sound of your names. Claw. Wing. Tooth. Scale. Tissue of flesh. Strike, Harker, strike! There is one very dear to me who has not answered. My love. Mina. There is less than a minute between me and the night. You must speak for me. You must speak with my heart. Give them to me! Jonathan, give them to me! They're thick of wood and a hammer! Arthur! I shall never forget that moment. The look on poor Mina's face as she stood there. The angry scar standing out on her throat. Her eyes like living coals in the last red of the sunset. She had torn the stake and the hammer out of my hands with the strength of an animal. Mina, do you know what you've done, woman? Do you know what you've done to us? You've released him, the evil is free. Look! The sun! As we looked down at Dracula... The eyes saw the sinking sun, and the hate in them turned to triumph. Flesh of my flesh, come to me, my love. Come into the night and the darkness. You have served me well, my love. My bride, my... gentlemen. All the evidence in this case is now before you. I've added nothing. And to the best of my knowledge, I've omitted nothing that might help to throw light on the extraordinary events of the year 1891, which culminated on that terrible evening in the Volga Pass. There remains only this one last report. When Nina Hager seized the stake and hammer from her husband, I believe she was under some form of hypnosis. She herself remembers nothing. But whatever influence was at work on her, she must, at the last moment, have rejected it. For at the exact instant the sun disappeared, it was Mina Harker who drove the stake through the heart of the thing that called itself Dracula. At that same instant, even as we looked, the wound on the side of her throat was no more. As for Dracula, before the scream of the creature had died from our ears, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In the final moment of dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. <laughs> Tonight's production of Dracula by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater was the first of nine CBS broadcasts in which this brilliant group will bring to life a series of great narratives. In the cast tonight, Dr. Van Helsing was played by Martin Gable, Jonathan Harker by George Kolouris, Dr. Seward by Orson Welles, the Russian captain by Ray Collins, the mate by Carl Swenson, Mina Harker by Agnes Moorhead, Lucy Westenra by Elizabeth Farrer, and Count Dracula by Orson Welles. Bernard Herman composed the original music and conducted. Dan Seymour speaking. <laughs>